Welcome Bethlehem Church Online family. So glad you're joining us today. We have an exciting person on here today who's never been on this side of the camera, never. but it is my friend Eli, soon to be your friend too. Hey everybody, <laughs> my first time. Uh, this is the initial online host. Yes. I've been a part of, obviously I'm on staff here at uh, Bethlehem doing production. So I've always been behind the scenes and so now I'm in front of the camera. Uh, it's been great. Yes. Yeah, I'm excited <laughs> to be here. So. So glad he's here. And the cool part about it is he's actually been like on the other side recording these pieces. And so he helps make That's this right. online experience great for you. And so we are so excited for him to be on this side of it. Sure. Yeah. Um, but we're so glad you're joining us today. It is Memorial Day weekend. So right. you may be on the lake, at the beach, wherever you are. But we're so excited for those who have gone before us, who've given their lives. And so thank you to those yes. who have done that. Thank, thank you, so you for much. those who have served our country so we can live in that freedom um, that they have given their lives That's for. Right. And so we're excited for the service. Um, but if you are on the lake at the beach, which I wish I was there. Uh, me too. <laughs> yep, <laughs> for sure. I will be, but yes. not today. <laughs> not today. Maybe tomorrow. That's right. Um, but put it in the comments below. Let us know where you're watching from. Maybe you're normally at 316, 211, Oconee. It's okay that you're not with us in person. Um, you're still part of Bethlehem watching online. So we're so glad you're here with us today. That's right. Yeah, it's cool to see all the stories I've been hearing from 211 Oconee, just wherever I go, I hear cool stories about you guys that started out watching online. Next thing you know, you get plugged in here, if you're local, um, then you start serving. And it's just cool to see the overflow of that. Uh, that all starts right here online. So, yes, that is yes, so cool. So many stories come each and every week from y'all. So let us know how we can pray for you, um, how we can help you take next steps here at Bethlehem. Because I said it before, you are a part of Bethlehem, even if you're watching online out of state in a different country, That's wherever right. you're at, you are a part of it. And so we are so thankful for you. Um, but we're excited to jump into service. Yeah, and so. Sure. So let's jump in. Let's do it. Bethlehem Church, happy Memorial Day weekend. So glad to see you. Let's all worship together. You stand with us and sing.
sing this bridge of the song, I can't help but think about who I used to be and how I was before I came to know Jesus. And I just, I remember what it feels like to be called in. You know, like that, that first when it starts and you're like, maybe I should start going to church. And then you're standing in the room and people are singing and you're like, oh, my skin is literally leaving my body. I'm so uncomfortable right now. Because when you're in the presence of God, you have to do something with it. It demands some sort of response. And I just remember when, when he started pulling me in and I, was, I felt compelled to worship, but I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know, I had no idea that Jesus coming was actually for me too, that I was included in the whosoever. I didn't know that. I had disqualified myself in my mind. I couldn't get over how God was pursuing me. But then I just encountered the living God, the resurrected Jesus, the Holy Spirit of God that rose Jesus from the grave, breathed life into me. And so now when I sing, I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I just remember who I used to be and who I am now because of Jesus. So I don't know where you stand this morning. I don't know what you walked in here with. I don't know what kind of stress, what kind of pressures that you have in your life, but I just wanna encourage you. Jesus is enough and he's always worthy of our praise. So let's sing this with everything we have. I sought the Lord and he heard. And I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard. worship leaders, we get together on Wednesday mornings right now, and we're looking at Old Testament worship. We're looking at seven Hebrew words is one of the things that we did last week, um, and just really diving in and seeing like in the times of David and the tabernacle and worship that was going on, um, and the seven Hebrew words are incredible, and I just want to be completely transparent with y'all just so you don't think I'm up here trying to be super spiritual. I failed English and Spanish in the same semester in high school. Like 10th grade, I literally didn't pass either class. I had to go to summer school, it was a whole thing. So the fact that I'm studying Hebrew words is a testimony of Jesus' work in my life in of itself. Do you know what I'm saying? So, so just to encourage some of you like, wow, she's really, no, I really don't have it together. It's just something that we're doing as a group. But one of the words that I learned last week that I thought was really powerful is yada. And what it means is to extend the hand. And 
I, what my favorite thing about learning the word is yes, it's cool, extend the hand and it shows in the scriptures where it's used and in its context and all that stuff. But the opposite of the word means to bemoan. And so oftentimes how that looks physically is wringing of the hands. So bemoan means anxiety, stress, pressure, tension, like the, what you feel in the back of your neck. And sometimes this is what it looks like. Has anybody ever done that? Does that happen? And it's, it's so, it's really powerful when you think about how God gave us a word that's the direct opposite of tension. It's just like throwing it off. And so we're gonna do gratitude. And I wanted to share that with you and I wanna be super clear. I'm not, I'm not telling you this so you lift your hands in the room and it, it just feels and we're all faith filled and it just feels better. No, no, no. I'm telling you that because the king of the universe is present in this room and he's worthy of your worship. And a lot of us think that raising our hands is a charismatic thing or it's, it's put aside for people that just grew up like that or they just been through some stuff so they feel like they're free. You are free too in this room to worship the King of Kings. There is nothing you can do that can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. He is worthy of your worship and the outward expression just means you're completely undone by the good news on the inside. So I just wanna invite you into that this morning. The only one who can measure how worship went in this place is the one who's being worshiped and that's God. It's not about me. It's not about any of us up here. It's not about the people around you. We are here for him. We are here to encounter him. We are here to go into the gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. And so that's what I wanna invite you into this morning is freedom, which is your inheritance. So y'all sing it with me. It's an oldie but goodie. And all my words fall short And I got nothing new How could I expect All my gratitude well, I could sing a song that I could sing As I Then you never do. Come on, give him what he's worth. And so I throw my hands and praise you.
we applaud you. You are worthy of our worship. You are worthy of our praise. You're worthy of every sound I could ever make, God. I will make it unto you in your glory and your goodness. I'm so thankful to be in the kingdom of God. I'm so thankful for Jesus. We're thankful for the blood of Jesus that sets us free. We're thankful for the freedom that is our inheritance. And Father, I pray in the powerful name of Jesus today that you would meet every need in this room because you are God the creator. You can do that. You know where we are. You know our circumstances. We're desperate for your presence. So Lord, I pray for a fresh fire for every single soul in here today. I pray that blind eyes will be open and that deaf ears would hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how you've made a way for us, how you have set us on this path of freedom and that we would just walk in it. Lord, we love you. Everything we do is for you. It's all for you and for your glory. So God, come get your glory. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray and all God's people said, amen. You guys can be seated. Well, good morning, Bethlehem Church. My name is Daniel Shadrach. I'm the high school pastor here at Bethlehem, and we are so excited that you are here joining us for worship. We know there's a lot of places you could have been this Memorial weekend, but we are excited to have you in the room. Well, at Bethlehem, we believe that everyone has a next step, that everyone has a next step in their faith walk and their, their journey with Christ. And so whether tonight is your, or this morning, is your first time at Bethlehem or your hundredth time at Bethlehem. We wanna come alongside you as a staff, as a body of volunteers to come alongside you and to figure out what are those actions to that next step. And so in our lobby, there's a connect table. We have volunteers out there that would love to meet you and to support you in that. Well, last week we got to, uh, we had a lot of fun in this room. And then we went from here and some of you got to go over to our new 316 campus and actually got to walk the building, you got to see the classrooms, you got to see the worship center, and we had a blast getting to be out there hanging out with you guys. Now look, if you weren't there, it's okay, I got your back. I got your back today, all right? Because I wanna give you a little update on the, on the campus out there, and it's probably my favorite update because it's the update of the student building. So will you check this video out as we see our new student building at the 316 campus? Bethlehem Church, we are here back again at the new church property. I am standing in the outdoor courtyard just outside of the student building where a lot of fun is going to be happening on this courtyard week in and week out. And so here to tell you more about it, I've invited my good friend Spencer Haynes. Spencer, are you excited about this? I am absolutely pumped up about tell, this area right here. Tell them what's going to be going on outside of the student building right here on Wednesdays. Come on. Uh, this is an absolute game changer for us uh, because right now if we send them outside we're sending them straight into a parking lot now we have tons of space for them to interact to hang out uh, we've got small group spaces that are gonna be outside of the buildings we've got fire pits on the back side there's actually gonna be an outdoor amphitheater uh, where we can actually do worship sets and all those kind of things out there as well yeah but then I can pull nine square I can pull gaga we can have a lot of fun in this area we're super Man, excited about it I'm jealous I'm gonna start going I believe you should yeah so it's gonna be amazing, outdoor area, but now we're gonna take you inside the student building and show you more there. All right, so we are now inside the building, standing at the entrance here. So Spencer, tell us what is behind us and what's gonna be going on uh, inside the building behind us. Yeah, everybody's gonna check in as soon as they come through these main doors. And then after that, this is where the community happens. So we'll have couches, we'll have TVs, we'll have board games, all those kind of things, ping pong back in the back. There's actually a cafe at the very end uh, that we can actually do coffee. We can do all of our beverages and our, our snacks and all those kind of things with access to the outside courtyard, which is really stinking cool super cool and then i mean we've got the main room which yeah. is gonna be awesome which we need to check out yes all right so let's go check out the main room show them that yeah. so this is student worship space tell me about the space so this is a little bit bigger than our current south venue so we can get about 450 people in here but the room is flat instead of tilted so we can use this for uh, parent banquets we can use this for sunday morning with middle school where we do table groups um, but also we can get swallowed up this makes it intimate this makes it more of a camp feel where we're crowded in together worshiping together and it is going to be awesome yeah i can't wait to see what's going to happen in this room high energy packed with students it's going to be amazing love this space so that is the student building. I, I know you're excited. I'm excited. Cannot wait 
for us to be in this space with students. It's going to be amazing to see all that God does. And listen, we're going to be back again with some more updates. Coming up next time, we'll, we'll hit some kids space, some buddy space. We'll show you uh, how cool that is over there. Uh, but until we see you again, love you guys. Man, we are super excited about that. I can tell you that a part of the, the student team, we are thrilled to be able to fill that room up and we are gonna have a lot of fun in there. But we know that that is built all uh, by the generosity of each and every one of you. At Bethlehem Church, there's four ways to give and it's that act of worship and giving that's not just about building these buildings, it's not just about seeing the new student building or anything. It's about what's happening even today in each and every one of our ministries of the changed lives that Christ is having. And so we're really excited about that. But this Memorial Weekend, uh, I get the honor to introduce to you our OC campus pastor, Jeremy Curtis, who's going to be with us today. But before we dive into that, I wanted to take a moment and an opportunity to, as, uh, as tomorrow is Memorial Day, I wanted to take this opportunity to honor and to remember those who fought and died for the freedoms that we have in this country every single day. So would you turn your attention with me to the screens as we honor and remember those? How do we say thank you to those who gave everything? How do we honor the men and women who made the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom? We say thank you by remembering. Today, we honor our heroes. Lives given not in vain, but with purpose. We stand grateful for their courage, their strength, and their resolve. For the fabric of America is stitched together by the thread of the brave. Today, we remember, and we will never forget. Well, that's worth celebrating. Can we do all that, do that together all across the room? Well, uh, my name is Jeremy. I, uh, I am the campus pastor of the, the primary main campus over in Oconee. I just ride that joke in the ground, you know? Uh, no, my name is Jeremy. I get to do that over there, but I, I've been here for, for quite a while. I've been here for about 10 years, and uh, it's been a great ride, and, and I've been able to serve at each campus. Uh, and so to be here with you today, especially on a day like today where we get to celebrate and honor those that have paid the ultimate price, because when you give your life to something, like when you have given your life to something, and in this case, even more so, when you've given your life for something, there's no mistaking that. There's nothing confusing about what their intent was in their life, what they were aimed at. Can we agree? Like, it's pretty clear. And for all of the question marks that we've got all over the world about people's differing uh, belief systems and, and uh, opinions, boy, there's some opinions. And there's some opinions in this room, let's be honest. Uh -huh. Yeah, right to your left or your right. There's some opinions. There are all of those. There's nothing confusing about this. They've made it pretty easy to define what it looks like and to answer the question like, what are you for in your life? Did you give your life to it or for it? Those, that pretty much answers the question pretty quickly. And when you look at the life of Jesus, when you look, read through the Bible, I think you see, you see the same thing. Because what do I mean by that? Like when you give your life to something or for something, did you go past a reasonable amount? Did you go beyond a point that most people won't go? Right? So everybody loves, all of us love things and give our lives to something to a point. I have no, uh, there's no mistaking that in this room, all across the room, you, there's something or someone or some place that you are giving your life to. But if we can be honest in the room, I would raise my hand in this. 
we do that to a point. Can we agree? Like most of the time, we do that to a point. There's only so far we're willing to go. Let me introduce you to my, uh, some people, my family. Can I introduce you to them? They're right here. Here they are. He's, oh, oh yeah, applaud. I shouldn't have had to ask. All right, when you look at this, you know, you should just be like, oh, all across the room. But this is my family right here. This is my beautiful wife, Jasmine. These are my kids I'm going to introduce you to. That's me. All right? And so, so, so this right here, this is Eli. He's 12 years old. He just had his birthday. Uh, he's a really, really sweet kid. He's really respectful. Um, he's, uh, he's a bit opposite in me that, that I'm, I can be kind of loud, outgoing, and he can be quiet at times until he gets around his buddies and then he can he can be pretty loud himself and he's a pretty good athlete speaking of opposite of me now I don't he's really fast no one's ever accused me of being fast all right real slow yeah but not fast and he uh, I, 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 I think the only attribute that I've probably gotten above him on is I'm, I'm tall I don't know if you can tell I'm 6'5 standing on this stage right here, I'm about 10 feet tall when you add the stage with it, but I'm 6'5", and the, I've really not done anything with this 6'5", and especially athletic, because you know, I'm here on Memorial Day weekend filling in for the lead guy. So there's your easy, yeah, I, this is what he's got right here. Uh, that's me. Uh, this is Noah. That's Noah right there. Noah is, is uh, he's very passionate. He's really, really funny. He makes me laugh all the time. This is Eden right here. She's super sensitive, but she's also spunky all at the same time. And this one down here, if you can see, this is Melody squinting right here with the sun on Easter. Uh, she, she is God's uh, proof that you don't decide when your family is done, he does. <laughs> Number four. All right. That's her right there. Listen, if you'd ask all these little ones right here, if dad's for them, they would resoundingly say, yes, absolutely. These little girls would give you all the reasons why. Depending on the day, these boys may be, uh, yeah, maybe. But they would tell you, yes, I do my best to love them, to give them everything that I can. Uh, but I know the older that they get, tell me if this isn't true, the older you get, the more you grow, the more you experience relationships, the ebbs and flows of them and all, the more you get kind of burned in life, and the, maybe the goods and the bads of it all, you begin to get that, that sense of like, you, you, you get why people love things to a point. And if you were to ask them maybe later in life, that regardless of what's true, I would love them to know in. You might ask them, was well, dad for you? And something pops up in their head where they got in trouble or something. They go, yeah, he, he totally is to a point. To a point he's for me. There's an ending point there. Now, true or not? That's true. Me too. Like, I love things and I go after things, but there is a point. Listen, I love this church. Like I said, 10 years of my life, I've given to this place. But, you know, they, I'm not going to give all that up for you guys. I love you, but they're awesome, right? Right. So there's God, there's, there's church, and then there's them right there. Pastor Jason would say the same thing. Like, he's going he's gonna to love to know in. You know how much he's given to this place, but he's not giving his family up for this place. There is a point. There is a line right there. Like if you're like like, like if you if you ever met my wife, like I'll tell you this, she loves me to a point. All right, and let me tell you what that. <laughs> let me. But listen, you you wouldn't you wouldn't know it until I asked her to come up on stage right here and share her heart with this crowd right here. You would see a jasmine shaped hole in the wall and her running to the lawyer's office to go on. That was it. That was the line. He knows I don't like being in front of people. That'd be her point. We got any alumni in the room, if you graduated from a college or some sort of institution, it's awesome. But it, it, maybe you graduated from UGA, go dogs, you know, all the tech fans in here are like, you're burning this place, all right. But if you're a, do a dog fan, you may have gotten a letter in the mail and the letter's addressed to the alumni and you're so proud of the letter you just got. It's like, they are so thankful that I'm their alumni. And you open up that letter and if you're UGA grad, let's say, you open up that letter and they're like, we're so proud that you're an alumni of the University of Georgia. Because of you and so many here, we've been able to increase this place and it's never going to be seen as the same again. Enrollment's up. We're back-to-back -back national champs. You're like, go dogs! I love this place. You know, we've, we've increased enrollment and all the degrees and master's opportunity, opportunities and all of that. All of those are growing. You're like, yeah, I love this place. My school is awesome. And they go, that's why we want you to contribute to our alumni fund. 
and you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't I just contribute to that fund for the last four or five, if you're me, eight years, all right? I thought that's what I've been doing the whole time. You love that place, you love it. But when they, get the, they send you that letter, you realize, ah, I love it to a point. You love it to this right here. I think it's this word. It's reasonable, right? Like it's reasonable. You give yourself, you love things to a reasonable amount. I think we all fall into that. But here's why I love Jesus. Why I love the gospel. Because when you read it, don't you find that that's really not how he lived his life. Like maybe you could even say, we'll add a couple of letters to the front end of that word, that it was unreasonable. That Jesus really lived to this unthinkable amount, past the point that any of us would go. If you think about the road of crucifixion, the road that led to the cross, like at any point we would have stopped, right? Because that would have been reasonable. I've gone this far, let's stop. But that's not what Jesus did. That's not what he does. And I think an anchor statement as we start out here today would be this. Isn't it fair to say that we love things to a reasonable point, but the love of God is unreasonable? I think that's fair to say this morning as we jump in to the scripture, we have gone through uh, the book of Romans and, the, uh, and, then, and in particular the bulk of chapter 8 and we find ourselves on the back side of this. And we read this where Paul is writing this incredible piece to this, this encouraging freedom style writing on the backside of this where he's just so excited about where he's come from. And it's written from a place where he, a moment in his life where everything changed for him. Everything changed for him. And I think if you can grab a hold of this, if we can right size some of this for us today, because I think there's a piece that we struggle with. But if we can right size it here today, I think it could change your life. And I want to show you how. But as we jump in, Romans 8, verse 31 is where we start. It says this, what shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Since he did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all, won't he also give us everything else? Who dares accuse us from God, uh, accuse us whom God has chosen for his own? No one. For God himself has given us right standing with himself. Who then will condemn us? No one. For Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us and is sitting in the place of honor at God's right hand, pleading for us. Can anything ever separate us from Christ's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. No, despite all things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. Now the whole of this, we read through it, and it's amazing, like it is encouraging, but I think when it goes to sink deep, when we go to really apply this, we get, we pull the emergency brake when we get to one particular phrase. And this is just me, as I read it, through my thoughts, as these are the things that rose up in me. There are a few different points. The one I'll start with, though, is this phrase hits us a little different, each one of us. God is for us. Doesn't it? Sometimes that's like, really, is he? Like, because... I don't have this, or I don't see this, or I don't, like, how do I, how do I really know that? God is, God is for me, because even when it comes to God, we kind of feel like, am I the only one that at times, it like kind of feels like, yeah, he loves me to a point, to, to a reasonable amount. Maybe that's just me, but it gets to the point that where we, we stop reading the expl explanation that Paul gives us as to why because we are too busy telling ourselves why that cannot be true. And from my own thoughts, I think a few things bring us to that. Here's the first thing I would say. I'd say one of the reasons why is because we don't operate that way. Like, I mean, we don't operate in the same way that we're, we're seeing the life of Jesus for something, celebrating and, rem and, and remembering on Memorial Day those that have gone past that reasonable amount themselves. We don't often find ourselves operating that way. So if, if you can follow this, it's really complicated to reconcile God is for us when we don't ourselves operate in the same way. So it almost, there's no link there. Do you see what I mean? Like we don't, we don't push past a certain point. We don't love with no ending in mind. It's a complicated task for us. And I think it's one of the reasons why, like, tell me if this is you. 
right? We, we kind of calculate what we give ourselves to and what we love. It's pities at a time, right? A little bit here. A few here, it's minutes at a time. A few minutes here, a few minutes there. It's, it's a piece of my heart at a time. A piece of it here, a piece of it there. This is how we operate. This is how we live our lives. And so to say, to say God is for me comes against what I'm actually for and how I actually live. And the Bible tells us his thoughts are our thoughts. You know this, right? He, his thoughts are our thoughts. His ways are our ways. But we kind of pencil in right underneath that. But also, my limits are his limits. Like how far I go is how far he goes. How far I love is how far he loves. But that is not the way he operates. So it's hard for us to, to get there at times because we are thinking based off of how we operate, but we gotta switch that thinking. I would say, could it, could it be possible that the problem is not in Paul's words here, the problem is in how maybe you operate. It's, it's probably not what actually God is for, but what you're for. Because here's the, here's the truth of it, if you can follow me here. The, the, there was nothing confusing about the way Jesus lived his life, historically speaking. There's nothing confusing. Like, believe he raised from the dead or not, all right? Like, that's the linchpin, the centerpiece of it. But even, here, even so, believe he did that or not, reading historically, eyewitness accounts and everything, there's nothing confusing about the way Jesus lived his life to death on a cross. The question mark is, is there something confusing about yours? About mine? If I asked your family, I'm not going to, relax, but if I asked your family, what's mom for? What's dad for? What's your brother for? What, what are they for? What would they say? If I was to ask you and you were to be honest, hey, what are you for? What would you tell me? Right? What, what do you lead people to? James says, in the book of James, it says faith without works is dead. And he's not necessarily saying that you're not saved or you don't know Jesus, but he is saying it's hard to tell if you do or not, if, if your life is not an example of Jesus. Think of it like this. If you lead people somewhere, where are you leading them? If people were to follow you, where are you leading them? Can I make it practical really quickly? If you paint that picture and ask those questions inside of like, like church, like a body of believers come here. You see volunteers all over this place. A lot of them, honestly, you can say, there's no confusion about where they stand and what they're for. Is there on yours? I don't mean to press too hard, all right? I want to have, make friends in here today, but I'm just saying, like, what are you living your life for? What are you giving it to? What are you giving it for? Because if you begin to shape it like Jesus did, like Paul did, like so many have gone before us, reading the word God begins to change, and reading God is for you begins to change. Maybe this is you. If that first one's kind of a sneaky little point there, if it's like, uh, it's, you know, you just, this revelation, that was a blind spot for me. I didn't realize I didn't operate that way in the link there. That's the greatest thing I've ever heard, Jeremy. I wrote all those notes down. Everything you said, it changed my life. If that's probably the first point that just happened, here's the second one that probably you've spoken before. You've said, I know I have, many of this room have felt this way, but how could God be for me? I don't even feel like I'm qualified. So if you're taking notes today, maybe you, Jot that down and it would, your thoughts maybe roll something like this. Knowing who I am, knowing my thoughts, knowing my past, knowing my family, knowing my job, my skills or the lack thereof, if you're me, uh, and knowing my heart. Knowing my heart is how it is. How could I ever qualify for this kind of love? And I would ask you to do this for a second. It's, context is everything, right? So if we can consider the source, the writer. Who's the writer? Paul. Paul's the writer here. So if we can consider Paul, who was once named Saul, a lot of theologians in here, a lot of biblical scholars, good job. Uh, it's helpful to consider the mindset of what he's writing from, because he's writing from, like I said before, this monumental change in his life, this thing that, that marked him. All of his writings coming from this one particular moment. I mean, if you knew this guy when he was Saul, you would understand this dude was awful. You talk about church hurt. You go, you go back to the days of Saul. This is church hurt. I mean, I, what I mean, like he threw him in jail and then killed him. That's church hurt, all right? That hurts. All right, this was Saul. His entire life bent against Jesus. 
Most of us in this room wouldn't even say, if you can, if you can follow me here, because I'm painting you a picture about a real live person and how he was, right? So we can see this whole qualified piece. If you knew Saul, you wouldn't want to know Saul, especially people in this room. Most of us in this room would not say we're against Jesus. He was. He was literally, his life was bent against Jesus. And then one day, on his road to persecution, on his road to keep doing what he was doing on the road to Damascus, a voice stopped him in his track, dropped him his knees, and he said this, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he falls and he trembles. Something's different, something's changing. And Paul asked a question that the answer to this question changed his life, marked him forever. And everything that we see that he wrote, that he lived as Paul under the lordship of Jesus happened because of this moment right here. And in that moment, he asked the question, Lord, who are you? He said, I am Jesus, the one you've been persecuting. Now get up and go. Everything was different. That conversation changed everything about Paul because Jesus took him in that moment after he speaks his name, reveals to him who he is, right? Reveals to him who he is. He physically blinds him. If you read the story, he physically blinds him so maybe he could for the first time see that his entire life he had been been against Jesus, the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the ruler of all things, the one who bled and died for even him. His entire life he had been against him, but yet Jesus was always for him. If Jesus only loved to a reasonable amount, Paul or you or me would have never been qualified for such an encounter. Yet, he loves past that point, and Paul knew it. And I'll tell you something like this in the, in the world of like qualifying. Like if you think, if you live, you're always going to feel unqualified if you think you set the standard for qualification. You don't. In fact, I would say this at times, we all feel like we've, we've disqualified ourselves, but you're overthinking your power. If you would just write this down, and maybe you journey back to this at some point, but you cannot disqualify what he has qualified. That's not yours to own. So don't, be, don't believe the lie that right standing or your qualifications have anything to do with you. They have everything and always have had everything to do with him, with Jesus. Maybe this is you today. I, I think... I think many of us have said this in the room, but maybe it's not even just like God is for me. Maybe, maybe you actually feel like, like he's against you. You ever said that? Like everything feels like it's working against you? Well, God's like actually against me. He's for everybody else, but he's against me. Like I introduced you to my, my two boys there, and like I said, they play some sports, but I think the greatest sport in all of sports is one sport. That's flag football. <laughs> Let me tell you why. One reason, I love it. I, I just sit in there, love it. We do flag football on Friday nights, and you're just sitting there in your tailgating chair watching them snatch flags and throw passes and cheer, and it's super fun. The other reason is probably because it's the most low-commitment sport that we have. <laughs> one practice, one game. One practice, one game. Thank you, Lord, for providing flag football. It's awesome. <laughs> It's awesome, but uh, so, so, so Noah, my number two there, he, 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 um, he, he, he thinks very quite often from time to time. He, he, he can think, like, I'm going to go out here, I'm catching a pass, I'm throwing a pass, especially early on when he first started. Like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it all. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to catch a touchdown, I'm going to throw a touchdown. I'm going to catch an interception, and I just might catch an interception and run for a touchdown, you know? I'm gonna snatch a flag, I'm gonna get tackles, I'm going to be God's gift to flag football, all right? Now, he's never said that, that's an exaggeration, but he, got, he can have that confidence and, and think that at times. And, 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 but, but when we go to those practices, you know, they can be at the end of the day, it can be hot, they can get cranky, you know how they, you know how they can get. They get mad at stuff, they start, start blaming things on people, kind of odd things, like things that don't ultimately make sense. So he goes out for a pass and he drops it 
And he's like, oh man, it's the sun, the sun was in my eyes. The sun was over here, why is it over here? It was over here, who moved the sun? Who moved the sun? <laughs> like nobody moved the sun, man. I just watched five of your buddies catch the same pass. It's, it's, it's not that complicated. Well, it must be my gloves. It must be the, these gloves, man. They've got, it's gotta be these, man. I can't, it's like you know, slipping. I thought, man, those brand new gloves. Oh, look at these. It's gotta be my shoestrings, man. My shoestrings are not the right color. I run weird, you know, I can't. You know, I can't, I can't do it all, you know. That's not shoestrings. Well, it's got to be that guy over there. He didn't do what he's supposed to do, so I can't do what I'm going to do. He's got to do what he's going to do, so I can do what I'm going to do, all right? It's none of those things, man. You just want to go, you know? <laughs> but you don't because you're a good father. And uh, so you take some time and you talk to him. You try to walk them through, and you just hope some of it's sinking in. You know, each one of your kids, you just apply the same kind of logic in different ways depending on how they receive. You just hope it sinks in. And one day we're riding in the truck, and we're talking about somebody did the same thing. I even asked Noah about this. You, he didn't even remember this, but uh, we're riding in the truck. It marked me, and, he's, and, and we're talking about somebody. He goes, somebody was blaming somebody and confused about something or they wasn't doing what they were supposed to or whatever and, and, and Noah speaks up and he goes, man, that guy needs to quit blaming other people. Look at himself. <laughs> and I was like, well, before I could say anything, he goes, kind of like me, huh, Dad? <laughs> and I was like, you are the wisest man to ever live, my son. <laughs> you know, but what happened in that moment was just a perspective shift. He had this new perspective. He had this new humility about himself. And, and I think perspective is probably one of those words, it's probably the most powerful word that we just take it for granted. But if we could take a new perspective, lots of things would change for us. And maybe, maybe our culture with a tendency to blame and ask the wrong question, maybe in this moment a perspective shift for that question, why is God against me? Because we could go through layers, but we really don't have time. So I thought I would flip that on its head because sometimes doing that gives you a new perspective. So what if I asked the question this way? What would it actually look like if the God of the universe was against you? So if he is God and he is real and he is all powerful, let me just paint a picture for you really quick. He has always been. He is before all things, and everything that is made was made by him. He sits outside of time and holds the universe in his hands. He stopped the sun in the sky, Noah's reference. Uh, annihilated armies and kingdoms, brought plagues at will, and parted the entire sea. He became flesh and God. He became like us and still stayed like him. That's crazy. The seas and the winds obeyed his word. He can walk on water. He can heal the sick. He can make people that couldn't walk, walk again. People that couldn't see, they can see again. He raised the dead. He let his own people kill him just so he could raise from the dead to save his most valuable creation and follow his own perfect justice system. So I ask you a perspective-shifting question. What would it look like if that guy was against you? It ain't good. Even if a portion of those things is true, not even half, not even, a th like if a quarter of those things are true, you're still in trouble. If that guy is against you. Like in fact, like if that guy's against you, you don't exist. So maybe this logic makes sense, maybe it doesn't. But if that guy in his perfect justice system, like if you're, you're, you don't exist or either he is for you. He's either for you or you don't exist, but yet here you are. It'd be like a QB. We'll stay with the football analogies here, right? It'd be like a QB. He snaps the ball. Defense is coming at him. But not only that, his offensive line turns and starts running at him. Both teams clear the benches. They're both running at you. The fans come out of the stands. They're running at you. Planes are flying over the stadium, dropping things on you from the sky. The world converges on you, right? And still, that wouldn't even be what it would be like if the God of the universe was against you. Instead, Paul says he spared nothing for you. 
He spared nothing for you, not even his own son, Jesus, the centerpiece of all things, the centerpiece of the Bible and all things, the firstborn of all creation. He did not even spare him for you. How much more will he love you and take care of you and be for you? You with me? He asks a bunch of questions in here. I don't know if you notice in this scripture. If God is for you, then who could be against you? If he doesn't spare even his own son, how much more would he give you? Who could accuse us? What can separate us from the love of God that is in Jesus? He asks all these questions, right? He already knows the answers to them, but because of his experience, he asks all of these questions, daring anyone to answer them opposite of his own powerful experience with Jesus. Because he knows who God is. A lot of the questions that we have from Scripture come because we don't don't remember who He is. We've forgotten, for some of us, who He is, the one who saved us and brought us out of the muck. For some of us in this room, we don't know who He is because we haven't met Him yet. So I take you back to another Scripture the book of Matthew where Jesus is standing with his disciples and he asked them a question he said who do they say that I am remember the story and they say well some people say you're John the Baptist some people say you're Jacob some people say you're Jeremiah Isaiah other prophets this that and then Jesus asked them a question A life-changing question, he asked them. And then Peter responds, and when Peter responds, Jesus anoints him in that moment and said, you've answered this question right, but you didn't answer it because any man gave you this answer. You answered it because the Father revealed himself to you. And because of this, I'll give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Because he answered this question. Who do you say that I am? So imagine you're there in that moment. Imagine you're standing with your friends or a group of people and Jesus asks you, who does the world say that I am? And you have some, some people say you're just the same God that everybody else is worshiping. Some people say you're not even there. Some people say you're a dream, you're a myth, you're just a story. And he looks at you and goes, but who do you say that I am? To the question in the world, ultimately, if you can go with me here, the question in the world is, who am I? Who am I? Who am I? (laughs) Who are we? What is all this about? The problem with that question is it begins and ends with you. Now, I don't know you real well, maybe, but I know you well enough that ain't good. That if you can ask, who is he? Well, that begins and ends with him. The one who created you. So we've got to figure out the God and the Jesus that the Bible talks about. The truth talks about. When you ask the question, why is God for me? Why would he be for me? If you can follow this, I have, when I wrote this down, I missed it myself. Until I went to say it again and I went, oh my goodness. It hit me a little bit different. Why would God be for you? Because he created you for him. Do you know this? Like he created you for him. Now I know all of our thought patterns and what we've been given, the logic that we've been handed over the years is that you've been created to be a great dad or a great mom. You've been created for these people or this person to do this great work, to change the world. Maybe that's somewhere in there, but that's not why you were created. You were created for him that he could love you and enjoy you and that you could love him and enjoy him the presence of God is why you were created that's why when Jesus said to Peter why as he anointed him I give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven what he really is meaning is I'm giving you the keys to the presence of God my presence Billy Graham said it like this to, to operate outside of the love of God 
for each one of you, everyone in the room, to operate outside of the love of God and the for you mentality is to actually operate outside of your original design because you were created for him. It'd be like this, like, like, like a bird trying to live in the ocean outside of its element. Like a, like a fish trying to live in the air outside of your element. When you operate outside of that, you are operating in discontentment. You're operating in discouragement. You're operating in chaos because you are living outside of your original design, which is the love of God given to you, expressed most intensely and forever for eternity through Jesus Christ. Who do you say that he is? Is he for you? Of course he's for you. Because he made you for him. Man, you want to answer, that you get struggle with God is for you, it's because maybe you got more questions about him than you thought. But, if you find him to be all that I believe he is, if you find him to be the God that David found, that Moses found, that Paul writing here has found, if you... If you believe him to be and find him to be the God of the Bible who is for you, the, the creator God, the, the gracious, loving Savior, the comforting Holy Spirit who is for you, which means anything that defeats you has to defeat him. Anything that stands against you has to stand against him. If you find him to be this, then you will be convinced, just like Saul to Paul was convinced, you would be convinced of this. that nothing could ever separate us from God's love, neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries for tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below, indeed nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. If you're asking me, and I hope you do, this is the God I believe in, the God of the Bible who has given himself to you and is drawing you back to him. And nothing can separate you from that. Over in the South Venue, Pastor Dustin's over there. He's going to step up. Just take just a local moment right there. And here, here in this room, all across this room, would you stand with me? I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you fall into all of those categories. Maybe it's just one, or maybe you got it all figured out. I don't know. Maybe for you, there is some question marks about how you operate. You see that connection there, how, the, how who God is and what he is for, both and, and what you are for, they just kind of butt up against each other, and, and it's time to make some changes for you, and you're trying to figure out how to do that. Well, we'd love to pray for you today. Walk you through that maybe. maybe. Maybe you're the one in the room like all of us have been at some point that you just have not felt qualified. You just not even felt worthy and you're just not even computing the fact that when God creates things, they have value. He doesn't create things without value, right? Maybe that's a struggle for you today and that's, that's the path you're on. You're just trying to figure out what redemption looks like for you, what the love of God looks like for you, or maybe you've just lived your life just feeling like everything, including God, is against you. Wherever you stand today, wherever you land inside of that, I just wanted to pray for you. So let's bow our heads. Lord, I just think you're taking us all on this journey of not becoming more and more aware of ourselves, but becoming more and more aware of you. So for those in this room, like God, that I would ask the question, like, show me how to live. God, I pray that you'd show them. Right here, right now. Those in this room that are struggling with even feeling worthy, feeling qualified in the kingdom of God through Jesus, Lord, I pray that you would just reveal to them now it is your power, it is your authority, it is the blood of Jesus that sustains them for eternity, that gives them 
the power of salvation. For those that have just felt like you're against them, Lord, for whatever reason, I just ask that you would just reveal to, you, to them all that you are. That right now, that through the Holy Spirit, they, they would feel the presence of love and mercy and forgiveness and value from anything else but from your hand. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. As prayer teams come, let's worship. so thankful that you chose Bethlehem as your place of worship today. These prayer teams are still going to be here. So if you need prayer for anything, healing in your body, we want to pray for you. Restoration in a relationship, we want to pray for you. If you're standing in the gap on behalf of somebody else, we want to come alongside you. We love you guys so much. We hope you have the best week and we'll see you back here next Sunday. All right, everybody. Bethlehem, thank you all so much uh, for hanging with us. Hey, before you go ahead and turn off the TV or the computer, your phone, whatever, we want to pray for you guys. Yes. So if you could just drop your prayers below. Um, like I said, this week we, we love to pray for you all and we love to be interactive in your life. Not Like I said, you're not just viewing us. We're actually up involved in your life yes. and want to be involved in your life. And we want to be the church, and we are the church. So. Yes, that is yeah. so good. Um, we love praying for you. You get to also pray for other people on our prayer wall. Right. And so you can take that next step. That's a way for you to serve, even though if you can't be with us in person, to serve and pray for other people. What great opportunity we have there That's to pray great. for other people. And so it's we want to do that for you. So like you said, put it below. Head over to our prayer wall. But, I mean, I was so encouraged by Pastor Jeremy today. Same He's here. normally at our Oconee campus, and so you may not have never seen him. Mm -hmm. But just that question of, what if God was really against us? What would that look like? And man, when you think about it, it's like, why have I ever thought that he's against me? Because That's I have right. been blessed with so much so and much, he has yeah. loved us so much. And so wherever you find yourself today, I hope you're encouraged to know that God is for you. That's right. Yes, you, not just anyone else, but for you. And so we love you. We hope you have a great yeah. week. Happy Memorial Day weekend. We hope you have a great and safe weekend. That's right. And we yep. will see you again next Sunday. See y'all soon.